Let me show the correct screen. Good morning to you. I hope you're seeing the risk disclaimer. I think you should. Let me double check. Yes, you are. Okay, great. So we had a very, hey, good morning, friends. We had a very long uh, webinar yesterday, three hours, um, about macroeconomics and euro dollar futures. Has nothing to do with the euro dollar forex. Um, let's go. Let's see what the week uh, holds for us. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to make some pips. I was very, very sick last week. So uh, thanks to Jens Klatt for uh, stepping in. Thank you very much, Jens. I appreciate your help. Thanks to Admiral for your flexibility. I feel a little bit better, not really 100% yet. So this is a two week old trade. At the time I was looking to long the New Zealand uh, versus the yen. The reasons uh, you can go into the webinar from two weeks ago to look at the reasons. And this is then what happened. So. If I had put in a buy limit order, set and forget, so to speak, this would be a clear loss, obviously. What I tend to do is that I set up a, an alert function and I have a text message sent to me by the trade station when um, a uh, potential trade setup um, breaks via interesting price levels for me. Recall that we always trade price levels and not really um, anything differently. So. Um, as you can see here, something had changed in the market at the time. We have uh, very, very large bars. Um, and what usually happens here is um, that you will see fast money market moves. You can see this very well in the futures. Obviously, you can't see it in a candlestick bar. But be aware of very large bars um, because usually it means um, a so-called withdrawal of liquidity, i.e. us market makers at the bank. We just take out our buy limits out of the order book. And if a large client's call, client client calls us and wants to trade, we give them very low bids, yeah? very low bids for, in this case, New Zealand versus yen. The reason is we did detect a large seller in the market, um, and it's always the quality of the seller. So it makes a huge difference if, for example, BlackRock calls you to trade or some small savings and loans uh, out of the Midwest calls you, right? Obviously, BlackRock, given their size, is much more important to us, uh, and they could move the market just based on their vast order flow if they were to be inclined to do so. So that means large bars, um, danger, danger ahead. And then what happened is we have um, large bars down. Uh, we have what we call a top right and uh, bottom hold, uh, not top, bottom right hand hold. And then um, in the technical analysis, you guys would probably call this like a flag trade. What happens is um, there's an extension and it went right to the liquidity below the spring uh, low here, where at the time we had a, a reaccumulation for the long trade. So at the time, long trade was over, market makers detected a large seller, you have fast move, market move down all the way back to liquidity, and then we do the same game again. And this is what? A withdrawal of liquidity, the same thing. Nigeria for the Oops, Nigeria, sorry. The Nigeria Special That's the squawk. I keep forgetting to turn that off. So um, if you know how to trade, probably wouldn't have taken that trade. If you're not that firm yet with what's going on, um, fair enough, it's a loss. So moving on, headlines this morning. We had risk on. Why? Because U.S.-China trade talks seem to be progressing. My buddy uh, Donald Trump was, I'm sarcastic, uh, was tweeting um, about um, uh, solid developments uh, during the talks. So we had a pretty strong market risk on sentiment into the New York close on Friday, and that carried over uh, into the market open Sunday night, i.e. this morning, Asia and London. <clears throat> but remember, it's President's Day, so the Americans are gone. Not really that smart to be trading today, um, but possible. Uh, but be careful. Thin liquidity means could be exaggerated market moves. Asian equities were up. Um, we had energy names in Asia uh, outperforming, but then we had financial names um, uh, putting a little bit of a drag on the ASX. So plus 40 basis points there. Nikkei uh, was a benefactor of the weak yen. Yen is just super weak right now. Um, I'm still waiting for it to turn around to see some inflows. Um, very, very weak. For this week, solid economic numbers throughout the week. Um, so I keep an eye on that. Shanghai plus 2.4. Why? Um, there's a stimulus going on in uh, China. Um, they pumping out credit again. And the new Huan loans were larger than expected. It's always about what is expected. And they were the most on record. Hence, you see a um, liquidity pump into the market and that uh, carries the equities higher. And then the Hang Seng was plus 1.7. So risk on, obviously. Oil traded above 56. 
Uh, pretty range bound this morning, already made a bit of money. Um, we'll have to see uh, what gives. Um, quite interesting because Saudi Arabia is really cutting their production, um, but Russia isn't yet. So um, we're keeping an eye on that. Um, global growth, if it keeps cooling off, which it does currently, global economic growth, obviously there's going to be a drag on oil. Also, lower oil prices are implying lower global uh, inflation pressures. Hence, um, we have a scenario where we're not really growing economically right now in the world, and we're not really seeing inflation pressures neither. So that means central banks will probably switch to all being stimulus oriented again, i.e. dovish. Um, which is actually, and this is funny how our profession works, which is actually then going to be interpreted by the market, especially the equity market is bad. And you will see equity markets selling off once they realize, oh shit, um, we're not really um, that healthy globally, which we aren't. France and other EU countries are willing to give the UK legally binding assurances. Spelling error here, sorry, that Northern Irish backstop is temporary. That was a positive uh, news bit this morning. And as I said, it's President's Day. Have a quick look at our US-China trade talk indicator, <laughs> which is soybeans. And I don't know if any of you are trading soybeans, but uh, that price level there at 928, it's just a beautiful, let's hit it. We keep hitting it, hitting it, hitting it, hitting it, hitting it. Um, and then we see um, a leading indicator line here. And as you can see, these these uh, shorts were brilliant here, brilliant shorts. Right now, um, it's at fair value, nothing to do. But it's not really telling us, hey, the trade war's going to be, war is going to be over tomorrow, right? Um, I'm very, very careful not to be overly optimistic that this uh, will end, uh, i.e. this week. But I could be wrong, but I highly doubt it. So uh, be careful also with um, over committing too much in terms of long Aussie dollar or New Zealand dollar yen, just because you're thinking, hey, the Aussie dollar is going to rally just because the trade war is over. Um, yes, Chinese um, uh, FO, uh, Chinese um, Chinese authorities are pumping liquidity in the market. But like I said, that's not actually a positive sign. That actually means we have a problem. Um, so be careful, right? Um, for trading, fine. Uh, don't go into long-term uh, investments, in my personal opinion, at the moment. Uh, strength versus weakness overnight. Um, we saw bottom left-hand uh, side, we saw some uh, strength into the pound and then some profit taking in the New Zealand dollar. If you look at the top right-hand hold, what happened last week, you saw Aussie dollar strong and New Zealand dollar strong, which is a little bit counterintuitive because the RBA and the RBNZ came uh, out dovish. Um, but that's the market, right? Um, we manipulate higher to then send it on lower. Risk events starting this week. Um, I prepared a few slides for us because I don't think we have that much going on this week. Um, but in terms of the euro and the ECB, that's quite important. Let me ask you a question. Are you guys in general bullish or bearish the euro right now? Type in the box, bullish or bearish? Wow, excellent. It's like everybody's bearish. So obviously you guys are you guys are switched on. Dies is data dependent. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> You're the central bank now. You're data dependent. Central bank uh, speakers were uh, hitting the mic last week, uh, waking up to the reality that uh, we're having a cooling off uh, econ scenario in the eurozone. <laughs> it's quite funny to observe, actually. Thursday, we have flash manufacturing PMI coming in at, uh, or expected to come in at 50.3, which is a little bit lower than the 50.5 last. It's still expansionary above 50 slash 48. These are the lines in the sand, 50 and 48. Um, but it doesn't really scream um, uh, happiness here. And also what's important is the rate of change. Um, is the rate of change um, positive or negative? And it's actually negative. And then on the flash services PMI, we are green. We're expecting 51.5 versus 51.2. Nothing to write home about. None of this is, right? But it's interesting to observe that services are performing a bit better than manufacturing. Next question for you, interactive this morning. Um, Germany, uh, is it a domestic demand economy or what kind of economy is Germany, the number one economy within Europe? What kind of economy is it? Correct, these. Correct, Michael. Correct, Frank. Hey, Frank, you're new, or I haven't seen you before. Exactly. It's an export economy. It's an export economy. And Vedran even says export world champion. I like that. Um, exactly. So that's not going to help Germany that much um, that um, uh, 
uh, it's much more important to see how is German industrial production doing, um, how are German uh, export orders performing. Uh, that's really of more importance to us um, than services. Eurozone composite, the composite between the manufacturing and the services PMI is expected to fall 50 spot eight. And here, um, that's not a bullish chart, right? This is actually what the professionals are looking at and they're realizing mm, Europe, a little bit of a problem. We're having cooling PMIs. That's not really a screaming buy at the moment. And this morning, give me a sec. I'm going to, I think I have it right here. Uh, yeah, Barclays came out with a trade recommendation this morning to short the euro dollar at 113.10. At the time, it was at 113.10. Their target is 108.89, and their stop is at 114.49. And they're saying technical outlook and eurozone tail risk. Tail risk means um, worse than expected economic numbers. That's what we mean when we talk about tail risks. It's the same with we have upside risk or downside risk. Currently in the Eurozone economic development scenario, we have downside risk that the numbers come even uh, worse than expected. Okay. Um, so question is, will we see a turnaround in the economic growth or stagnation? I think towards the um, end of this year, we might actually see a little bit of a turnaround. But for right now, I think that's a bit early. So we'll have to see. And like I said, we had a couple of ECB guys hitting the microphone last week. Uh, so Rain, who's neutral, reiterated that recent data points, uh, recent data came pointing uh, to a slowdown and that the rates will remain low until their policy targets have been reached. Interactive question. What is the inflation target for the ECB? What is the inflation target of the ECB? Excellent, Bodo. Exactly. Excellent, Alex. Good job, friends. 2%. All right. Okay. Um, that's one of the policy targets that they're keeping an eye on. Um, Question is, uh, is actually inflation rising or is it falling? Um, if oil is coming off, it's going to be difficult for inflation to actually rise. And then we had Villaroy reiterating that timing of the next uh, rate move. Sorry, uh, I'm not quite awake this morning. I'm seeing here based on my typing. Depends on the length of the slowdown. And that's exactly right. The market is going to be focusing on, hey, is there any data coming out that's pointing towards it's going to be less worse in terms of its current development? Less worse is already good and the euro might bounce then. Friday, we have German final GDP, quarter on quarter, flat, flat. Recall that in the third quarter, German GDP was actually shrinking by 20 basis points. Now, the technical definition of a recession is two quarters, two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. So we just marginally slipped by a technical recession in Germany. Very, very, very bad if that would have happened. Very bad. Domestic demand was actually the key driver for German growth in the fourth quarter. That's interesting because it's an export economy like we just talked about and not a domestic demand economy. And then here I'm already wrote for you guys, net exports did not contribute to growth. That needs to turn around for this whole euro to actually be sustainably bouncing. OK, net exports need to turn around. German GDP growth doesn't look healthy here, as you can see. Yeah, um, that needs to be improved. Otherwise, there's no long term long in the euro. Could be a short squeeze in between, but that's normal for bear markets. Thursday, we have ECB monetary policy meeting account. And recall, please, guys, that last times the policymakers classified risks as now being tilted to the downside versus prior, the wording was moving to the downside. So they said last time, ah, we're moving to the downside. And now they said, oh, we actually tilted to the downside. I know um, it's odd. But once you go through a few cycles of their wordings, since they never change, you understand every communique by any central bank. Italy has entered into a technical recession, whilst Germany has narrowly avoided one. Yeah, Number one economy narrowly avoided a recession. Number three economy is in a recession. How bullish is that exactly? I'm being sarcastic. Question is, when exactly the ECB would shift from the current stance of rates remaining at their present levels, at least through the summer of 2019. Because we're all waiting for two things. One, LTRO, i.e. refinancing banks, once again, once again, European banks did not use the bounds in economic development. We've had 10 years of monetary printing, money monetization, and liquidity pumped into the markets. 
and the Eurozone in all its might and intelligence completely fucked it up and did not do any structural reforms. Nothing. The banks, especially the Italian banks, their non-performing loans are horrible. Horrible. So there's a next short for you. Well, it's actually went a long way already. Uh, it's not a short any longer, but it's not a buy yet. You can't really dip your toes into this. It's so toxic. The banks are so crappy over here. It's horrible. Uh, okay, anyhow, um, when will they actually change and communicate about LTRO? Yes, hello, we, the ECB, need to once again refinance banks. And two, the question is, um, currently they're still talking this nonsense about raising rates towards the end of the summer, i.e. from September on. Don't see that at all. There would have to be a significant change in the numbers for this to actually happen. And if, again, less worse is already good, then the euro can bounce. But right now, I would sell top edges. Okay, guys. Aussie and RBA. That was interesting as well. Yeah. On Monday, we have here too, the policy meeting minutes. And recall, they kept their cash rate last meeting at a record low of 1.5%. Record low. The statement was then, attention, unexpectedly less dovish because they just kept their usual rhetoric, their usual wording. And despite recently weakening, weakening economic data and shifting market expectations for attention again, an RBA rate cut this year. The market got a little bit ahead of itself. And then there was a massive short squeeze in the Aussie dollar when they came out less dovish than expected. But pff, next day, Governor Lowe hits the mic, says, uh, I guess you misunderstood us. And he officially shifted to neutral. Yeah. Um, based on increasing domestic and global economic, here's the word again, tail risks, i.e. downside risks. Okay. And here's a quote from him. Over the past year, the next move is up scenarios were more likely than the next move is down scenarios. Today, the probabilities appear to be more evenly balanced. Aussie dollar, who was in front of the screens, sold off massively. It was a train wreck. Boom. So the day prior, short squeeze. Day after that, boom, it was sold off again. Currently, Aussie dollar is sort of neutral because on the one hand, um, we may have this positive outcome in terms of the US-China trade talks. That could cause for some, in my opinion, not that sustainable Aussie strength versus, versus a neutral RBA and an expectation in the market that the economic numbers will continue to deteriorate this year in Australia, which then would force the bank, the RBA, to cut rates towards the end of the year. Inflation and growth forecasts were trimmed for the period up to 2020 in response to weaker consumption, global uncertainties, and downside risks. Okay, by how much? Good. Growth, that's GDP growth. For DEC 19 and DEC 20 were cut to 3%. It was at 325 and to 275, previously three. So they're taking down their growth forecast. The RBA is taking down their growth forecast. In general, you should be very wary of investing long-term in an economy that's shrinking, okay? If you want to buy something, you buy Aussie dollar government bonds. That is exactly the trade that you're doing right now or shorting the currency. Core CPI expectations for June and December 19 were cut for June to 175 and for December to 2%. Again, 25 basis points cut on both. Yeah, no inflation, no rising rates, no strong currency. Very simple. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, because we could go on and on and on, but it's not that relevant. Uh, pound, Brexit, Bank of England. What do we have? On Tuesday, we have average earnings index. Here's a, an economy that it is actually seeing labor costs rising. And we have seen that for a while. So again, on Thursday, is expected to rise by another 10 basis points to 3.5%. Unemployment rate is expected to remain at 4%, i.e. full employment. is another economy next to the US, Canada, for example, that is at full employment, which theoretically, when an economy is at full employment, has a hawkish central bank to fight inflationary pressures due to labor costs increasing. This is economics 101. And then we have the claimant count change that's also positive, expected to come in lower than last time. So the fourth quarter seems to be on track for a decent 120,000 gain in employment. 
The BOE actually, I listened to Carney uh, during the policy uh, rate statement. It's quite interesting for me to listen to him. Uh, that he um, he said, if we wouldn't have had this Brexit debacle, um, the pound would actually be rising, and uh, they would be talking about raising rates. Yeah. So once Brexit were to be resolved, the pound is ultra long. Do not miss this opportunity. Please don't miss it. Bank of England standing pat on rates until the fog of Brexit has cleared, if it ever clears, if it ever clears. Brexit Secretary Barclay is due to meet Chief EU Negotiator Barnier, okay? And PMA declared that she would return to the House of Commons on Feb 26, so mark that in your calendar, to report on her progress in Brexit negotiations. Over the weekend, I read that she's out there uh, wanting to meet all 27 heads of states of Europe now. Good luck. What a horrific... Uh, roadshow that's going to be. If no deal is secured by March 13, please mark your calendar, March 13, lawmakers may seek an extension to Article 50. Finally, I was way too early. Um, I expected an extension of Article 50 way early already, thus removing, at least temporarily, the option of a no deal Brexit. I hope you guys understand why they, why May especially, uh, and the Brexiteers want to keep the no deal option on the table. It's sort of like, um, it's sort of like um, when a country has nuclear bombs, right? Um, it would be so bad to drop out with no deal. It would be so bad that um, they want to kind of have this as an ace up their sleeve to threaten the EU. The problem seems to be that um, they're not really calculating how bad that's going to be for them as well. <laughs> um, I hope it's not going to come to that. Um, and I actually wanted to include this information from Goldman. They're currently seeing a 50% chance of May securing a ratified Brexit deal, 15% chance of a no deal, and a 35% probability of no Brexit at all. I still, to this day, I've kept repeating and I keep repeating that, I still have an expectation that they're not going to drop out at all. I could be wrong. It doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong. I'm trading the pound up and down. It doesn't matter. If where no deal Brexit, the pound's going to drop. Once this crap somehow resolves, the pound has very high probabilities of rising. Okay. Trade this morning, because I'm already 25 minutes in. I was a little difficult this morning because the economic calendar didn't give us that much. But I'm going to be aggressive. I love being aggressive. Every trader has different personality. I'm very aggressive. Um, I want to long the pound versus the Swissy. I was thinking about the yen, but then I decided... Um, <coughs> for the Swissy, because the whole economic data docket for this week for the yen is positive. So pound, okay economic numbers this week. Yeah, nothing to write home about. And obviously it's more trading in accordance to um, if the Brexit uh, headlines come in positive or negative. But we uh, are getting the first hints of a potential concession out of Brussels. Um, it just, no, I was going to say feel, that's wrong. The data is positive, and if we get some concessions, the pound could easily rally here. Swissy, cheap funding currency. Uh, for Tuesday, we have positive numbers. As we all know, Jordan, the head of the SMB, does not want the Swissy to appreciate significantly, and they constantly, repeatedly, like clockwork, intervene to weaken the currency. So it's a good option if you want to long something at the moment to go versus the Swissy. The risk to the trade is obviously if we have risk of sentiment change, then we'll see Swissy inflows. And or if we have negative Brexit headlines, then uh, the pound's obviously going to drop. Chart picture, quite simple. Liquidity above, liquidity below. Um, I'm going to actually be a little bit conservative and go below the volume point of control that we saw on Feb 19, down there at 129.30. And I'm going to give it an extra 15 pips. Uh, we also call this a square up and a roll reversal. My traders know that. So let's wait for the so-called square up. Um, they're currently using the liquidity above yesterday's high to potentially sell it off. Um, or it's a top right hand hold. It's going to go. Could go right away. We'll have to see. I want to be conservative. It's Monday. It's President's Day. Uh, let's wait for it to retrace a little bit. Give ourselves a little bit of breathing room. Long at 29.15. Take profit. 100 pips above. Stop loss 50 pips below, two to one risk reward. Easy peasy. Hopefully uh, that's going to make up uh, for uh, the New Zealand situation if you guys got burned.
but really you shouldn't be trading what I trade. You should be trading, you should be learning the business really, understanding what's driving the markets and then um, just use this Monday morning weekly meeting to get a grasp of the process and then start implementing it yourself. That's my desire for you guys. Don't follow anybody's signals. Signals are bullshit, it's bullshit. Psychologically, you're not able to follow them because you have no clue why anybody or a model is going long or short. Learn this for yourself, be confident, uh, do proper risk management and, uh, and give yourself time. It's gonna take three years for the business uh, for you to really learn it. Yeah, especially if you're part time. Um, but it's a lot of fun. And the problem is once you're infected with the virus, you have no option anyways. The markets will never let, set you free ever. I think a lot of us actually know that feeling. And it's just, it's in my personal opinion, the best job in the world. So hopefully it was, you found this value adding. I appreciate you guys. We appreciate you guys every Monday morning. I want to thank my traders, especially for coming in and supporting myself and the business every Monday morning. And thanks for all of the guys who showed up to the webinar last night. Thanks to Admiral for the opportunity. And I hope we'll see you all again next week. Happy trading. Trade smart. Live free. Thanks, guys. Here's Jay.